Okay, let's take a look at chapters two and three in the White et al. textbook and how this fits into our larger discussion of evidence-based practice and translational research. So obviously chapter two is looking at some of the, the major frameworks in terms of the development of knowledge. And it starts with a section on knowledge translation movement. And the first couple of pages are basically building up to that um, chart that you see starting on the bottom of page 28, the definitions of key knowledge translation words. And you see the specific words listed in that chart also fall here on this particular slide. I won't go in and describe each of them, then basically bottom of page 28, 29, and the top of page 30 is where you see it in that gray box there. Make sure you're familiar with those and you can see how the whole model works in terms of the, the knowledge transfer model with figure 2-1, the Glasgow and Emmons implementation model that you see on the top of page 28 there. So as you're looking through, once you finish that, basically you get into a section that looks at specific translation theories and frameworks. And I won't go through each of these, but I did want to include the slides for them. Um, you'll note that in the textbook, each of them are described in a paragraph or two. Um, Rogers is probably the lengthiest one there, which is about five or six paragraphs. But I wanted to make sure that you had the publisher's notes for each of these. And you can see at the bottom of each of these slides, they have the original citation from the specific article or book or book chapter where the item came from. And it, you can also see sort of what they feel as are the important points of each of these. Although the figures that you get throughout the chapter, I think, are quite instructive once you've gone through and read each of the um, descriptions for each of these translation theories and frameworks. And again, not to go into all of them, but just so that you have the notes for them, particularly when you download the PDF of the slides, you'll have the notes for each of these translation theories and frameworks that you find outlined in chapter two. And I'm sort of trying to scroll through them here and uh, judicious fashion, but giving you a chance to sort of look at each one. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do is as you're reading through, um, and I guess rereading through as you're looking through these notes, it's probably useful to pause on each of the items that you see here so that you can get a better sense as to how the, the framework relates to what it is that you might have or the specific context that you might have. So looking at this, I guess, last couple here. So here's the John Hopkins model. And so what you can see here is one of the things to keep in mind with all of these models is the main function of any of these dissemination models, these translational research models, is to provide a structured process or a structured system so that what you are doing in terms of the steps that you are undertaking to enact evidence-based practice into your um, into your specific setting or your specific context or as you are undertaking the process of translational research that if someone else were to try to do the same thing, if they were to follow the same model or the same framework, they should come up with the same results that you come up with with the obvious difference between the specific variables that might exist or that might be different between your context and their context. So moving ahead to chapter three, chapter three is actually quite similar, but instead of looking at translational research theories and frameworks, this one is actually looking at change and behavioral theories and models. So as you look through, it's this one is a little bit more um, focused 
on the idea of instead of providing a system or a process for how you go about doing something, this is having a theory that guides the the, the the design of the intervention or the generation of knowledge or how you are approaching a particular behavior. And one of the things that you're seeing in translational research, and this is true across many fields, is that the use of theory to guide translational research is quite small. And you can see there, according to Davis, Walker, and Grimshaw, only 6% of studies use the theory or model to guide the design of their interventions. And that's not specific to translational research. This particular study obviously is, and the 6% figure obviously is specific to translational research, but one of the things I think you'd find is if you looked at nursing research in general, and as you start to get into the literature, which will actually begin next week, one of the things that you'll note quite quickly is that much of the general research into nursing and I can honestly say into education and many, many other fields is a theoretical or that it doesn't use theory to guide what it's doing. Um, so looking at some of the theories of uh, organizational change and again, like chapter two, what you have starting on page 58 is just little descriptions of each of these particular theories, uh, these particular models of change that you've got here. And like the previous section, I'm just going to go through and give you a second with each of them. Again, across the bottom, you've got the original citations for each of these. You also have what the authors felt or what the publisher feels are the main points from each of these particular theories. So that way it allows you to at least get a sense as to what they saw as important. So for example, this um, contemporary change theory is the last of the organizational change theories and they've boiled it down to eight or nine points here. So they've taken essentially the three paragraphs that they've got there. So hopefully this will help you and guide you to figure out you know, which items are the ones that are most relevant to you in your particular setting and context as you start to think about this in relation to a potential problem or practice that you are going to focus upon or that you might focus upon as a part of your doctoral research. Similarly, then on page 62, it transitions into behavioral theories of change. So we move from organizational ones to behavioral ones. And in all honesty, many of these that you see here are coming from the field of psychology or from the field of educational psychology. Uh, so as I have to be honest and say, as I was reading through them myself, I saw a lot of familiar names here and a lot of familiar concepts um, that I thought were quite useful to me. And finally, we get into uh, the notion of change in the organization. So one of the things that when you're looking at all of these models, regardless if it's a model of organizational change, if it's a model of behavioral change, or if it is a, a model or framework for translational research, one of the main issues that you have to consider, both from the perspective of consuming research that focuses upon one of these theories or models or frameworks, as well as someone who might end up doing research or doing evidence-based practice using one of these theories or models or frameworks, is the issue of fidelity. Essentially, how closely are you following the specific model or theory or framework that you've chosen? Because obviously, the higher the degree of fidelity that you have with what you are doing, the easier it will be for somebody else to replicate what it is that you've done and to essentially be able to um, achieve the same outcomes that you've achieved, assuming they're working in a similar context. By the same token, it's also the higher the degree of fidelity would allow you to achieve similar outcomes 
to things that you've actually read in the research. So if you're looking to implement a specific evidence-based practice, the higher the degree of fidelity that you use with this particular intervention compared to what it is that the research you're basing it on did, uh, the closer you should be in terms of achieving the same outcomes that they've achieved. Finally, one of the things that you want to, I guess, take away from all of this is that while these are models, frameworks, and theories, they're designed as guides, and there are specific things about your context that may, A, allow one model to be more appropriate than another model, so choosing the right model, theory, or framework is important, but also getting to that issue of fidelity. There are some of us that, you know, have very different leadership styles, for example, than other people. And something that we're looking at when we're trying to translate this um, basic research that we're reading into an applied context um, in terms of a, a translational project if the nature of our leadership is significantly different than the leadership from the individuals who implemented the model originally, that could have an impact upon what it is that we're doing. So one of the things is when you're considering these different models and theories and frameworks is sort of an, your own metacognitive awareness of who you are and who your context or I guess what your context is. You know, if you are in an organization that um, the culture tends to be quite resistant to change and your own leadership style is much more collaborative in nature, chances are that many of the implementations you might try, especially if you're looking at the implementation being at a organizational level, you might have resistance in terms of trying to implement that evidence-based practice uh, intervention that you're, you're, you're hoping to accomplish. Whereas if you have an organization that tends to have quite a collaborative culture and you yourself enjoy working with others and enjoy um, you know, that sort of collective and collaborative environment, then the opportunity for you to have a meaningful impact around a specific evidence-based practice could be quite high. So having that you know, your own awareness of who you are as an individual as well as the nature of the organization that you are hoping to have an impact on is important in terms of the fit and feasibility of trying to implement many of these uh, practices. So that's it for the white textbook for this particular session. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or post them in the support and questions discussion.